Oh, okay. Thanks. It's, right, it's probably just somewhere right now. Right. Yeah, that yeah, clock's a little fast. Yeah. 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 I'll just I'll run down and check my email. Yeah. First order of business is a modification to the 40 car plan approval waiver from section 10.5 for 26 That's yeah, not on my agenda. Really? 95 workers. I'm feeling that I've got a uh, 95 Walker's Brook as well. Vertical implants. Okay. Good to go. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Cameron with the Morning Cameron Group. Uh, address 66 Elm Street in Danvers, Massachusetts. Uh, we're happy to be here on behalf of the Paracle Group. Teal Bernstein is here uh, from the Paracle Group. And we also have with us uh, Mike Radner, Michael Radner from Radner Design Associates. He's the landscape architect. Yeah. And we'll do, I'd like to walk you through the plans, um, which I trust will get up on the screen in a moment and uh, present the project to you. Uh, before I do, though, Teal, just want, I want her to give you a little uh, introduction on the company and uh, I'll be here for a minute. Thank you. Sure. My heart's like beating out of my chest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am Teal Bernstein, and I am the organizational development manager at the Perico Group. I um, wanted to give a little history of where this dental practice comes from. Uh, Dr. Gerald Kramer, who went by Mel, um, was the first periodontal graduate from the BU School of Dentistry in 1955. Uh, he served in both World War II and the Korean War as a naval dentist. When he moved back after the Korean War, he um, originally set up shop in Lynn, had a two operatory, two chair uh, dental practice, and in 1965, he had an opportunity to move to Swampscott. So he purchased uh, 90 Humphrey Street, which is a three-story white house right on Kings Beach. Uh, in 1967, another graduate of the BU program, Dr. Myron Nevins, joined him. And following him, uh, Dr. Gary Reiser, Dr. Roger Wise, Dr. Jim Hanratty, all followed almost every three years afterwards. Um, and then more recently, Simon Bernstein and Tom Stereo have joined the practice. Um, Dr. Nevins, Dr. Reiser, Dr. Wise, and Dr. Hanratty all actually still practice at the Perico Group. We have offices in Swampscott, in Wakefield, which we are looking to move to Reading, and Austin. Uh, we offer periodontal services, dental implant surgery, and adult orthodontics. Um, does anybody have any questions about the practice or the business or anything like that? Okay. Well, we're very excited to make Reading our new home. So, thank you. Thank you. Just want to get you a little understanding. Did you read the legal one? Sorry. Did you read the legal one? Sorry, before we before you start. I don't know. I had the wrong agenda here. I'm not sure why. It's from the meeting you missed. 
so I have to do the meeting I missed. <laughs> <laughs> So try to make one. Okay. <laughs> Notice is hereby given that pursuant to sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., on Monday, April 9th, 2018, 7:30, on the petition of Perico Implants North Incorporated for a site plan review um, for improvements and upgrades to vehicular access and circulation, pedestrian and handicap access, and landscaping to the property located at 95 Walker's Brook Drive, Assessor's Map 13, Lot 2 in Reading, Mass. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Department and Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday and Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. Okay. All right. So you covered it. Uh, we're here for site plan review. Um, you heard the introduction about the company uh, already. Uh, they're very excited to be coming to town. They're actually working on the interior renovation of the building now. And we're doing site plan review uh, because we are doing improvements to the parking area. Uh, and I'll walk you through the plan set that we, we submitted uh, before you. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, going to the sheet. So I'll walk you through the plan set. Um, I'm going to go through the civil plans and survey plans. Mike's going to talk about the landscaping and, and lighting. And then uh, I trust we'd have you know, maybe some questions and answers. Uh, so you see the existing conditions of the site. Um, if you could zoom out just a hair on that. Um, this, the property is shaped kind of like an L. So the property you're looking at is here. So it has this flag portion in the back down here and then your frontage on Walkersburg Road. You can see the town line with Wakefield is right here just off the property. You have town owned land on this side which extends out back and then uh, this is a, an access way uh, to see utilities uh, heading to the north. The access to the site actually comes in through the gas station which has a Dunkin Donuts drive through and presently as you come into the site you kind of drive around the drive through and in through this direction. There's a fence that runs in a guardrail along this property line, and so your access is through this easement, come around the drive through escape lane and into the site. Uh, once you get into the site, it's mostly an open area of pavement. Uh, there, there is some striping there, but the pavement's pretty old and chewed out. It just has its, uh, it's purple pavement, which means it's sometime in probably the 80s when it was put in, so it's time. Um, the building itself is about 6,000 square feet. It's situated right here in the front of the property. Uh, that's probably what you are familiar with uh, driving by the site uh, for the property. Uh, if you go just past this, you're going to be at the, the 128 intersection, so it's, it's real close to that area. Uh, there's some landscaping in the front of the property here. Otherwise, the rest of the property is pavement from property line to property line. About 80% of the property is covered with pavement or building, so it's mostly asphalt. There's no landscape island, so it really hasn't been much. It's been for, for parking uh, of, of cars. Uh, this has been an office use in the past. Uh, right now there's 70 parking spaces on the site and uh, there are a series of older light poles in the back corners and on the corner of the building here that have illuminated the site. They're kind of older style uh, downcast lights. <clears throat> there are wetlands on all sides of the property. We will be before the Conservation Commission on Wednesday this week. Uh, we filed a notice of intent with them so we'll be reviewing that with them. And uh, other aspects of the site in the existing condition, uh, the utilities all come in through the front of the building, so your water, your sewer, uh, electric, etc. There are a series of catch basins in the, in the parking area. And uh, one good attribute about the way this was built, the high point in the parking area is around the property line, and everything slopes in. So there's no water that runs off the parking area out towards the wetland, it all comes in goes into the catch basins, there's some sumps, and then this goes out to the wetland eventually this way. Okay. So the next sheet in the plan set is kind of a site preparation plan. So we have our road control information on this plan. Uh, the pavement will be removed, uh, will be cut right on the edge of the access easement here, and everything will be removed. Uh, the distinguishment on the kind of the hatched gray area in the rest of it 
the gray area is where we're fully removing all the pavement. So that's gone, the subbase is gone, and it won't be going back. The rest of the white area within this is where the new pavement line will be, will be situated. So you can see how we're pulling this in considerably on all sides of the property. Uh, a lot of emphasis on the front of the building here, landscape islands, and I'll get into this on the other sheets. Uh, but we're really pulling that in. So we're pulling off about 8,000, 8 to 9,000 square foot of pavement, about 8,700 square feet, uh, representing uh, a little over a quarter of the pavement area on the property is going to come out, which is nice. The existing light poles will all come out as well. So uh, two of them are actually situated off the property on the back here. Those will all be removed. And uh, there aren't really any building mounted lights now, but the ones that are pole mounted in the front, those will be coming out. All the landscaping, uh, the sidewalk in the front up to this point here, that's all going to be removed. I'll explain why in a moment. Everything in the front of the property for the most part is going to be maintained. So that landscape grass area, it's actually serving as a landscaping easement there and it's actually serving as some utilitarian purposes as well. There's a drainage swale in the front of the property which is mostly in the highway layout but it's utilitarian. So we're not really proposing a lot of work in the front of the property. Uh, Mike will get into those improvements uh, when he gives his presentation on the landscaping. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going to the next sheet. Okay, so the next plan is our site layout plan. So this is going to give you the overview of the improvements planimetrically on what we're proposing to do. And really, the, the primary point of, you know, of this project and what really started this conversation is with the interior renovations, we need to bring the building into code compliance with handicap access. So right now you get to step up to get into the back of the building. We need to make sure that that is handicap accessible moving forward. And the other reason why I want to do this, and it's kind of a unique property, the door that faces the front of the street, well, we're going to continue to leave that and it will be functioning as a door. Really, the front of the building is in the back side where you're parking. So the idea was to get that to look more like a front building so when you park in the back, it doesn't look like you're walking into a rear door to the building. So you can see this large area in front where we're removing all that pavement and asphalt. This will now be a large landscaped area. We have our walkways handicap access. There's a, a walkway that comes up to the main door, which will be on this side of the building here. You have a secondary door here. There will actually be a couple of steps up, but that won't be a primary door for the business. And then you have a side door, and I'll explain what this is for here. This, uh, as Teal was explaining, this is more of a surgical uh, dentistry practice. It's not outpatient, where you have people come in for cleanings and there's a lot of turnover. These are, uh, it's a far less frequent customer uh, turnover. And when the surgical patients are leaving the facility, they come out this door and there will be a, a railing on this edge and somebody would have to come in They might be under anesthesia. So somebody's picking them up, they bring them out this door and this front area here is for uh, picking up patients as they come out. So we're, we're allocating this area as a pickup and drop off area, eliminating the parking that is there now. This has a secondary benefit of if there is an emergency, pull an ambulance up or up to the front and it's unobstructed so you can get right in and out of the building. The rest of the parking lot improvements of course we'll have our handicapped parking spaces here uh, to meet the uh, requirements for that. 2% uh, grade so we'll be flattening the grade of this a little bit in this area. Uh, it's a little steep now. We'll be adding landscape islands throughout the parking area to help facilitate traffic. And the big change here uh, from a vehicular circulation again the access comes in through this easement currently comes through the escape lane for the drive through and people kind of spill in this area and then it's tough to tell what you do so if you ever watched it people would just help their skelter all over the place. What we're going to do is <coughs> find this and eliminate the fence and the guardrail along, along this section so that the traffic now comes straight into the site and it's circulated around and back out or around and into parking spaces. So we're going to better facilitate traffic to the use instead of people pulling in and having to navigate through the drive through or being a little confused. Uh, we're going to bring them right into the site. We're going to add a paracodental sign here, a directional sign, to let people know this is the entrance to it. And uh, directional arrows and do not enter signs will help control traffic so people keep coming out this way. The other feature we're adding in on this edge of the property, we're going to put in a five foot wide landscape island. And this will create a divide between the drive through and the property. So there really shouldn't be any question about, about where you're going to drive. Uh, we will also be pursuing uh, although not in this application, uh, probably a frontage sign in this area, and that's still, that'll be another application down the road, but just another directional sign to help facilitate traffic in and out of uh, the property. 
Uh, lastly, I did include the graphic for the new sign that will be replaced as an existing freestanding sign in the front of the property. That graphic will be replaced with the one you see in the plan here. Uh, if you don't mind, actually one more aspect on this. On this edge of the parking area, we did remove more pavement. That's going to be a snow storage area. It's the push point for the plows. And we did put a chain link fence on this side, uh, which will be slatted and vinyl coated. So that will be a good break. So when they're pushing snow, it's a good catch. It's a durable fence. It can flex a little bit with that. So we put that edge on that, on that there. Uh, yeah, great for the next one. So this plan, the next sheet is your grading and drainage plan. Uh, again, existing site, uh, we are in a floodplain here and the majority of the site is within the floodplain. So what that forces us to do is we've got to balance our cuts and fills. We're not allowed to fill in a floodplain. It gets another, uh, another whole issue, uh, both under the Wetlands Protection Act and building code. So <clears throat> what we did here is we are matching existing grades to the extent practicable. Wherever we can, we're matching grades. We are cutting for the most part through this area. There's a little bit of fill in this area and each of the landscape islands have a little bit of fill. But overall, we're actually creating more compensatory flood storage uh, through, the, through the work than, than, uh, than what's there now. We did the calculation on here, if you're curious to know the numbers. Uh, it's really a small site, so in the grand scheme of things, it's drops of water, but we do meet that code. Um, as I said, the snow storage area, we've created this to be a, a shallow depression, so it's only six inches deep, but it is an area where the snow will catch, and then if it does melt, it melts back into the catch basin here uh, before going back out, so you've got that sump, you've got two sumps to catch any of the sand and grit in the snow here. Um, again, you have your handicap access from your parking spaces up through the building, your handicap ramp, and into the building. This is all handicap accessible, there's a ramp here. Uh, we are balancing the curbing and the edging on it. So in front of the building, you'll see there'll be a six inch vertical granite curb up into this point, and then it'll transition to concrete to match the concrete, which goes the rest of the way out. The islands will all be uh, bound with Cape Cod berm, which is the shallow asphalt berm. Again, this, every inch counts. We want to keep that flatter. So we didn't have a six inch fill. We only had a four inch fill. So we did the asphalt berm on those. They're very durable uh, and they hold up well to plows and then on the back edge around the rest of the parking lot that's just going to be an edge of pavement finish so there won't be any curb on the outside and again the slope of the pavement comes into the site so the high points on the outside and all the stormwater runs in. I'll also note on this corner there's an existing easement uh, for the town to access uh, water and a sewer pump station I believe it's pump station which is quite a ways north so we are reserving this and leaving that open on this corner and there were some comments. I'm hoping we can get to uh, the draft decision that you guys put together. We can talk about some changes that, that we're going to make, minor stuff, uh, just through some of the town comments. Um, you mean south on the pump station? Yes. Yep, I'm sorry, south. See, north there. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, uh, you want to go for it? The next sheet will be the landscaping plan. Mm -hmm. I think we're ready to get into that. Let's get through the details. You have the uh, the more colored the one you sent later yeah. today. Oh, actually, yeah. it helps with the presentation. Sure. Oh, yeah, I think that's fine. We did some edit. We did some minor changes to the comments. Mike's going to show you a color plan. It's just it's more illustrative. Uh, but you'll well, see. It's easier there's... to see. So yeah, you can yeah. go ahead. That's great. So that's a good um, illustration there, the um, additional landscaping that we're doing compared to the, which one, really, the red. Thank you. Um, so Scott, uh, sorry, Michael Radner. Radner is also, um, you can see the introduction of the landscape islands in the parking lot. Um, I'll just, I'll sort of start at the front of the site here. Um, this is, this is a mostly grass area in the front of the site. There are some existing foundation plantings along the front. Um, and then there are a couple of trees. There are actually three trees. One here, here, and here. This one is now appearing as white space because it came down, in, I think, about two weeks ago in one of those trees. It, it was a victim to the storm. It was, a, yeah, yeah. Poor tree. It was just like good timing or bad timing. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> and then there's a there's a large uh, tree of like a flowering tree um, in this area right here, which is very close to the building. Um, we would like to take that tree out uh, just because it's it's getting into the, the eaves, close to the roof, it's close to the facade. Um, and, um, at this point, it's you can see it, it's it's life. Um, so we want to open up a little bit of the visibility to the building. There's another fairly mature flowering tree in this location that we're going to keep. We're not going to touch that one. Um, and then we're going to replace all of the foundation plantings along the front of the building to freshen up that look. And, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to go through plant species if you want, but we'll, we can save that to the end if anyone's really interested. Um, another foundation planting around the back, or we're sort of calling this the front of the building, the south side of the building. Um, the landscape island, as Scott mentioned, is, is over here. One of the things that we like to do is, because of the uh, patients exiting out of the store at this location, was to give them a little bit more of a buffer between us and the gas station. So there are um, a couple of large trees that are going in there. There's some arborvitae to give that um, screening towards the, the drive through at the gas station here. Um, introduction of new landscape island in this area with a, a large tree here. Shrub, large shrub plantings along this side. Um, new shade trees, these are maples along here. Um, a couple of pin oaks in this island here. And then this one doesn't have trees because there's a uh, light pole here and a light pole here. And these basically light, I'm sorry, a third one in this location. And these basically light the whole parking lot in this location. So if you go to the lighting <coughs> plan to navigate to that. So, can you read all these numbers? Um, <laughs> so, you, but you can see basically this is the half foot candle uh, ISO line on these, these old lines right here. So you can see that we have sort of the coverage that we need over that parking lot, and then we have some low uh, 42 inch high light bollards along the front walk here, and that lights these areas, and then two building mounted lights along here to light this walkway. I should mention there is uh, an existing light pole in this location, which is not owned by us. It's owned by the uh, Shell Station owner, and that does provide light at this exit lane right here. And you can see the, uh, you know, I've added the um, catalog cuts for these light fixtures, um, elevation that shows the relative heights of those um, light poles right there. And this is all, it's dark sky compliant. These are LED fixtures, very energy efficient. I'm sure you've seen this before. This is basically the standard for sight lighting right now. And there was some there was a discussion of uh, timing on the lights. Do we want to get into uh, that? Or? Yeah. Um, there was a comment in the, in the certificate about the time of day uh, came from the Conservation Commission. Uh, so these lights will be on a timer. And they'll probably be shutting down between 6 and 8 o'clock, somewhere around there, um, when the business shuts down for the day. So there's no need to illuminate the parking lot at night. Um, so they'll probably be shutting them down at night. They'll be on a timer. Um, and who am I going back to the color plan? Just had a couple other points I wanted to make. Um, so I mentioned uh, in existing condition, there's 70 parking spaces on the site. Uh, we're going to cut that back to 40 to meet zoning it's plenty to accommodate the use but we're taking out a lot of the pavement and with that a lot of the parking so as you can imagine a lot of the traffic that could be going to this site will be decreased this use will generate about one quarter of the traffic that an office will generate in your peak a.m. and p.m. hours so I put some of that information in the technical report if you uh, saw my table in there because I know everybody read through that um, but uh, we did think this was a very passive use for this property, and I think the reduction in the parking is a good good indicator of that. The fact that you know they were able to, to sacrifice that, and parking comes at a premium these days. You know it's very expensive to build. So, um, and again, I mentioned we're reducing the pavement by about 8,700 square feet. So our existing uh, lot coverage uh, with pavement in buildings, which is around 80%, that's going to decrease down to about, I want to say, 61%. Uh, I do have the coverage calculations of the plans. Uh, if my memory is failing me a little bit here, 
but it's a good reduction in the pavement. Um, and then I want to note, uh, lastly, on the drainage, uh, we're doing as much as we can. In this case, the drainage on site, uh, and you, you might have seen some comments from the town engineer to, to look at the sumps. We did go out and measure the sumps. Uh, there are some sumps in the catch basins, even though they're filled, we're able to push through the, the silt and get to the bottom. So they are functioning to provide some stormwater management on the, on the property. The real issue we have with this site is it's built really low. We're only a foot or two above the wetland. The, the cover over the pipes is very shallow. So for us to really do anything outside with the existing drainage pipes out on the site, it's going to be a major undertaking. I mentioned that floodplain issue. We'd have to bring the whole site up a couple of feet to get cover of the pipes. The pipe's a little surcharged in the wetland already, so it means it's already a little bit underwater. Uh, it would be major to do. So we're kind of stuck with the drainage that we have. So what we focused on was reducing pavement, adding landscaping, and decreasing the load on the system. So these are all improvements. It's a redevelopment of the site, and we think it's going to be a significant improvement from a water quality uh, perspective on stormwater. So I think uh, that's all I have. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, staff, anything to add to that? Um, um, just so we're clear on the total number of parking spaces, so there's going to be 43 or 44? 44. 44. Great. Um, yeah, other than that, I think it was pretty good. Is that 44 a result of the slate redesign that happened yes. today? Okay. Yeah. So, just so you know, they did respond to some of the comments that were in this, and we got some revised plans today. Um, that, they, that we have that we can pull up on the screen um, so that you can talk about them because I think you're going to take those plans to the Conservation Commission yes on Wednesday yeah. so um, if, if you want to go there right now or um, we can well it might affect people's comments can we see what yeah do you want to go done? through this sure yeah okay. absolutely there's not much um, actually you can leave that color plan right up there okay. that shows the new layout so um, you'll see over here uh, the prior plan, we came straight in. There are two parking spaces here. Engineering had asked that we move those spaces in this area, which would help facilitate the access out so there's more pavement to drive over and less grass. Uh, so we, we kind of did a little swoop into the property with the aisle, and that increased the size of the snow storage area on the end. It was a wash as far as your landscaping coverage, so it didn't really change there. But yeah, the, the total parking now is 44 spaces as a result of that. I think we picked up one on the on the on the change there, um, and that's really. Uh, I think all the other comments I have were just on the on the draft decision uh, that was written up, and I'd be happy to go through that. But those were really the changes to the plants. Um, and we clarified the two light poles that are on the back are going to be removed. I don't think they were, that was clear on the plans before. Those are coming out. Then you're putting one new one in. One new one. And yeah, so, are you submitting a new photometric as well? Yes. Yep. We have that. That's, that's the in the photometric. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the photometric is the same because the light bulbs didn't change. Okay, because uh, the conservation administrator had some issues with the spillover into the wetland and habitat areas, okay. so that might come up on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. okay. And that's why we talked about the timer. Okay. It's it's going to shut those down. So. Okay. You meant to shield the far right one though. Bad to put a shield on the back side of that top right one. If that's what's causing the spillovers. Yeah, we can do yeah. I don't know if it is. Well, now that I know that there's an issue there, we'll address it. Yeah. Okay. All right. uh, comments from the board? Well, the, um, I remember the last time the Shell Station came, came before the board. And it is a 24 hour operation. Uh, they so took that away. We did? I thought they took that away. I thought they. Stop doing 24 hours now. The owners requested. The owners requested. The license modified, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, good. No, fine. Okay. The, uh, it's it's a interesting site because of the uh, shared access mm -hmm. and the easements. Uh, it's not clear from your <coughs> plans how the uh, exit area uh, 
combined flow, I guess it is. It's basically the, the Dunkin' Donuts drive through and the exit from your own uh, site is a shared area, and it's not clear which easements are under control there. I mean, it's, it looks fine. I mean, it will yeah, certainly I, work. I can go through that for you if, if you like. Okay, because the first concern that, that crops up is the yeah, angled parking on the right side of the shell station is threatening your uh, entry path. I, presumably, there, you've got some uh, working relationship with mm -hmm. shells so that you don't uh, you don't get blocked out. It's important to note too. That's not changing. That's how you get into the site now. That aspect. Of Except it. that currently you you come into the back of the shell station and turn left. You follow the escape lane. Yeah. For the drive-through, so you're, you come around so this we'll, way. We'll still be following the escape lane, but instead of turning left, we'll be going straight. Just go straight. So it's it's still the same. It's still the same path in. <coughs> okay. But it doesn't turn. It just yeah. continues. So right now you come back here and you just turn this way, and now you just go straight. So you're just eliminating, we're eliminating this here. Yeah, if you remember, one of our concerns when the gas station came in was that, that movement going left, there was sort of a blind, you were blind to the right side as people were coming out of the lot. Yeah. Say that again, Nick. Uh, the current movement is to come into the lot, go around the, the, the gas station, and as you come and enter this lot, yeah. you're blinded by either the fence. I think there was a fence, fence there. Yeah, right. Right. Take a fence yeah. down or right. something. Right. So there was concern about that movement. This is a little better. Okay. And the only yeah. thing that blocks them actually is that the loading trucks tend to park in that escape, yeah. escape lane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you've got to go around them or the. Well, the, the, they'll. They'll be talking about that because they, they do have that easement. They have the right to pass through there. It, it shouldn't be obstructed. And we've looked at the striping that they have, and I think that it allows for a 12-foot lane, a 12-foot dedicated lane, mm -hmm. in addition to the drive-through lane. Um, that that lane sits in between the drive-through and all of the parking spaces. So all of the striping for the parking spaces mm -hmm. is to the right of that. What amounts to be a seat. right and and. Um, the issue, I think, for you all will be their management of their um, of that parking. Yes. Um, because I know that was a concern of ours when we work with them to approve that site layout, um, and so uh, functionally it should work. Um, you know, in terms of the geometry. And so does the do the truck radiuses still work without that outlet? to the left side of the driveway there, to the current outlet. So, right, so a truck would be able to pull in here, and no, this... No, no, he's no the, the gas, so the gas station... Lower on the shell. Yeah, are they actually cheating and going through that when they leave? They wouldn't have been, yeah, they wouldn't have been able to come in here before. No, oh, yeah, right there. You're talking about here, yeah, so right now this is a solid fence. Oh, no, 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 for Dunkin' Donuts, right? Because they, I'm assuming, like every other Dunkin' Donuts, they bring in, um, there's, it's big trucks. Big truck, it's usually yeah. one 18 wheeler a week, and then you have your box trucks that come in. Daily. And they circle, right now, they circle around the back because they can. Um, and Nick's question, and it's it's not really, it's, it's not your issue, it's their issue, um, is can they still do that or, Will they still do that and drive will over they the planting? Maybe through your lot now. Or, or will they be driving over the arborvitae? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I think it's a fair point. And, and they very well could come through and, you know, short of laying on the ground, I don't know what would stop them from coming around the long way. Um, you know, but certainly for patient safety, we would discourage the truck traffic through the site. And that, and that delivery truck, I'd done quite a few Dunkin' Donuts, so I can't speak for this application, but it's typically one 18 wheeler a week is the big one that you see coming in. Uh, I haven't seen a situation where there's two. That's when they're getting all their, you know, the, the bulk goods that come in during the week, and then you have the smaller trucks that have the daily deliveries of the, of the food. So. Yeah. yeah, but every <coughs> single 18 wheel Dunkin' Donuts truck parks in the worst possible yeah. slot. <laughs> 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 right. I, 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 I have witnessed a delivery, and they did park nose in on the escape lane so that the drive through traffic continued around and then when it left it pulled so it, it kind of went yeah. to yeah. the traffic but I did 
I didn't see that delivery and that delivery truck did stay in that, that escape lane. Right. So, it, like John said, it's their problem, really. My concern is they're going to cut through your lot, and that truck, I don't think, can make that turn without starting to wear out your island. You know, the first island as you enter your site. So, you may just want to check what the turning radius is look on, like on that and see if their wheels are going to start eroding everything you're doing at that entrance. Yeah. Well, they want to be good neighbors. There's, there's going to be some understanding of that. <coughs> I can tell you the if you switch to the site plan, um, it's a little deceiving because we have a 28 foot wide aisle here. So as you come around, as you come around this sweep, you have you can turn out further than if it was a normal 24 foot wide. I still and think I think, those real wheels I think hit that. the the area where it's going to be narrow is right here. It's, it's on that side, yeah. not not the other side. So that's going to be discouraged, but. Okay. The, the concern that, that crops up is that the currently the uh, the straight back access to the your parking area your the L is blocked off, but the uh, corner between the properties is open. That's the ac the access way. So the trucks currently will come in and go into your parking area. But you show a landscape island mm -hmm. and <clears throat> basically blocking off that existing access path so that you'll be um, the vehicular access to the to the shell station will be compressed or changed. So again, I wasn't there for the permit that you guys were. If I was permitting that station myself, I would be demonstrating how that truck can turn around on that site because they don't have an easement to come onto the property in that area. So I don't know what was on on file for that or what was presented to you at that time, uh, but I trust that they should be able to do that on the site. They they did they did they demonstrated that they would do all their loading in the front. Right. I re actually it's remember that right. conversation because we have, as Nick just said, we have a hard time with Dunkin' Donuts and all those trucks parking in the front. And in this case, if they park in the front, then backing out onto Walker's Brook. I mean, having a, a problem with cars turning in. I, I do remember that. Again, I, I don't, that's, that's, the, that's the Shell's issue about managing their, um, uh, their, Circulation. Our concern, of course, is with patient safety and right. the safety of people on the property. We don't want that truck coming through. That that could be dangerous. And that, that was really it was a privacy concern and a safety. We didn't want the drive-through spilling out and the escape lane spilling out because people when they're in the drive-through, they're in drive-through mode. They're not thinking about people walking around the drive-through and out in that area or other cars. You know, you kind of you kind of got your coffee blinders on. You know, and that was really we want to facilitate that. And at the point where where the cars start to come back out in this area, this is where they, they merge and they come back out. So you have the aisle coming down and then the drive through ends here. There's a stop line and it comes out this way. So you do merge and you come back out this common entrance. And we have a very low intensity use on the property. This isn't, you know, we're not, we're not expecting a lot of conflict. And a lot of times, especially with the peak hour for the Dunkin' Donut shop, that's in the morning. You know, your patients will start to come in at that time, but a lot of the discharges where people are exiting are going to be more towards the afternoon. So there's not an overlap in the peak uses on the site too. Um, I guess the for me um, the circulation issue here um, that's that's on on your plate is providing. I think you need to provide some signage. Well, two sets of signage. One is at that merge point um, where the where the the island ends is yeah some some yield signage because you, your customers are going to be the ones that are um, more cognizant than people put, mm -hmm. turning out of the the drive-through with their mm -hmm. coffee and doing you know so um, and they probably have a better viewpoint so um, so I, I'd like. To see, you know, some signage and making sure that you have some I think sort of, season. you know, yep. yield or you know, watch for entering um, uh, traffic. And then I guess the other thing is 
um, if, if I'm a customer of yours, I'm going to think that I'm going to pull in in what is now the exit lane of the uh, the exit driveway of the shell station and I'm going to see the building and I'm going to turn left right into there um, so I, I assume that you have that in mind already of something to do so that so that you um, direct traffic around the back side um, and I, I don't know if I saw those or I missed those signs, or, signs and I guess their, their idea of placing a placard or a sign over by the easement instead of at the front might help with that as well. So we'll, we'll do a couple of things. First of all, on that um, white placard sign that sits directly in front of the building, um, I would like to put at the bottom of it, and of course this is subject to application, right, where we'll say enter 300 feet that way, right, to give someone the impression that the entrance isn't right, right there. there. We will also include on our referral pads, which every patient gets when they come from their referring dentist, um, a picture of the entrance and precise directions, which we I mean, we do for all of our sites. Right. right? It just it helps because a lot of times the patients are coming there for the first time and they need to know where they're going. So one of our referral pads is a picture of door nine. Right? We can say just come into door nine, but we actually show them a picture of door nine, <laughs> kind of a you are here um, to help them help them understand. Uh, we've also talked about updating our website. <coughs> the entrance on the location is more people are digital unless they're carrying a red sheet of paper. And then um, we'd also like to, subject to application, um, put a sign at the front of the property, at the front of the entrance, um, to let people know that is the dedicated pair of entrance. And you're, you're getting an easement or you have an easement? We currently have an easement. Yeah. yeah. Um, the town engineer doesn't talk about capacity of the drainage system. You just mentioned you'd like to see a four foot sump, but you're saying it's really shallow. What do we know about the existing capacity of the system? It, it's it's working fine. Uh, we're not talking about a huge area. We're decreasing a lot of the load that's going to it by eliminating the pavement. Um, there is an operation and maintenance plan that's included with this that's going to be memorialized, if not in whatever decision this board issues, but uh, for certain, the Conservation Commission will have an order conditions uh, which will have that operation maintenance plan. So you can tell there really hasn't been a lot of maintenance of this, these, these structures uh, were actually budgeted in the, in the cost estimate for the site contractor that he's got to clean these out as part of his work. Uh, so those will be maintained. There is a sump. Uh, there is a two and a half foot sump on this catch basin and there's a three and a half foot sump on this catch basin. So we're getting two spots where we can catch. The other two look like they were added on at some point. There's actually only a three inch pipe that drains out of those and there's not really a sump on them at all. We think those, because it's such a flat parking area, we think those were just added on to help with, with maybe some puddling in the parking area. Um, but once it's paved and every, you know, new pavement, I'm not expecting any issues with the drainage. Okay. I don't have anything else. Else? Do you know how tall the current light poles are? Including the one in the front that's owned by Shell? I think they're between 20 and 25 feet. I did not measure them, but just by eyeballing it. Usually I, I try to go for shorter light poles as opposed to taller. Yeah, if, if you can go back to the light. Um, so do I. <laughs> so, um, uh, right now the, the poles are basically lighting the site from the perimeter mm -hmm. and, and um, there is some spillover um, into the wetland area, but these are, the lights are angled there on that, it's like 45 degree. <laughs> things that shine out so they're not dark sky compliant. So in, other, in order to um, get the dark sky compliant and to be able to light it from the center to the perimeter, we're, we're trying to get to zero with the property line. And I understand we're a little bit over here. We'll adjust that. But you can see that these are just, you know, sort of almost perfect the way that they um, So wait, the reason we're going higher is to be able to reach across 
the 60 feet from here to here. If I go shorter. And to have fewer. I'm sorry? And to have fewer. Yeah, yeah. If, we go, if we go shorter, we're not going to be able to reach across, and then we're going to end up with lights all on the perimeter, and then we have an additional problem in the wetland side. So it was a way to reduce the number of night light poles, cover the whole parking lot, so very efficiently. Okay. That's why we're at 20. Thank you. Uh, public comments? Okay. Any comments? So you said you had some, some edits or comments about the site plan decision? The draft decision. The draft decision. We'd like to go through I think, did you, did uh, Mike send those to you today? Had some red lines. Not the decision. I did not see now. that. Um, it's, it's at the board's discretion. Um, I guess I can... I can go through my markups here uh, quickly for you. You can tell me if they're significant or not. Um, I'm on page one. Uh, just with the plan dates, uh, I will update those. Uh, we have some minor changes we've added to the layout based on the comments, and we'll add the yield sign on to the signpost that we already have put in the plans for do not enter. So you have the do not enter facing Walker's Brook and the yield facing into the site. So I think that'll be an easy change. So, so wait a second. Can we write the decision based on the plans you sent us today and then condition these other small things? Sure. I mean, that's just the easiest yep. from yep. our st standpoint. Sure. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. <clears throat> we talked about the parking spaces. Um, 44 is the total number on page 2, right on the bottom line. On the top of page 3, Top line, uh, two handicapped spaces, period. The parking lot would be milled, overlaid, and restriped. Um, it won't be milled. It, it will just be removed. So I don't know if we need to get, I don't even know if we need to say that, but we're going to repave the entire parking area. Uh, milling's a different process. Right. And then uh, the very last uh, word on that paragraph, it says opened. Uh, that should say will be removed. It's talking about the access gate. So we're not going to open the gate. We're actually going to remove it. Okay. Um, the second bullet down with the arrow, uh, potential parking spaceship, that was a comment. I guess it, uh, we changed it on the revised plans we sent in, so we could delete that. On the trash pickup and deliveries, item 7. It reads, medical waste will be removed from the site daily with sharps disposed of once per month. Uh, I'm questioning if we need to get that specific on that because that could change depending on intensity of use. I was going to suggest just say as needed uh, from the site. Yeah. Oh, would um, that imply a dumpster? No, or no, no, some no. storage? Nope. No. No. One quick question going back to the um, parking space shift. So are you agreeing to mark those two, those new spaces as employee only? Yes, as so they'll be they'll be okay. striped. We can't put signposts because that would block the easement, but we can stripe, you know, employee only on those. Okay. And I believe that was on the plans. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Alright. Yeah, to be note says to be striped employee only. Okay. And the reason for that is so if the town does need to get out the easement, they can just knock on the door and employees with the cars, as opposed to patients who could be stuck there for hours. Okay. Um, on item 8, the first arrow, uh, it starts with blocked access, and I felt that <coughs> section should be removed, and site access through the 40-foot right-of-way will stay the same, would be sufficient for that. Oh, so these are these were, you know, comments for the board to talk about, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, if you're fine with taking that out, board, then that's fine with me. Okay, it was just kind of speculative. I, we, we understand, you know, we got to make sure we maintain that. Um, so the next bullet down, the applicant has, reads, indicated that negotiations are underway for a sign. The applicant has obtained an easement for the sign. Can we talk about that for a minute? Um, 
because does that end up being an off-site sign, and then is that a problem with our um, sign? Yeah, I was thinking that. Line? So it's the right thing to do, but I think we need to do a little bit of zoning gymnastics in order for um, that to work properly. Because currently it would be a directional sign. It would be how we would. Yeah. And that's very small. Yes. Yeah, it's got it's got the copy logo with an arrow that points in. But the that's, dimensional, it's that's it's the got other the challenge. Sorry, I think it's two by three for directional signs. Yeah, it's tiny. There's two challenges, right? One is the offsite component, and then the other is that it might end up being very small. Is that what you had in mind, a two by three? Uh, it it was subject to the application, so the the easement grants larger, but it's all subject to town approval. So, so it, it would just be. Can we put that language right in? Right in it say subject subject to. We're not approving a sign here. We're just just noting that they've already obtained an easement for it. So yeah. when they come in with a sign app, we can deal with you know, viewing angles and, and safety and all that. Yeah. I just wanted to bring that up, not so because be, yeah, yeah, because it's, yeah. it's so it won't be a surprise it's because it's a it's it's an issue that it's not on your property in terms of the way that our zoning is written. Yeah, so we basically prohibit off-premises signs, um, except for temporary signs. So we need to... Maybe the way to yeah. do that is that it's actually a sign from the shell station, and the shell station has to apply for the sign. Okay. Yeah. Well, probably a good we idea. Right. Yeah. We've, we've actually had a conversation about it, and I think yeah. it would be best for both of our businesses yeah. for yeah. that, yeah. and they were very amenable to it. I think yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah. a good so suggestion. Really, yeah. The um, which district are we in? It's industrial. Okay, because, the, because within the industrial district, we may have a little bit more flexibility with the assignment. I don't remember offhand. Well, we'll look into yeah. it. But I like. I think that suggestion is mm -hmm. a good one. I think it's. Um, yeah. You said with that one? I'm on page four. Ten, you're getting lighting, first arrow. All you can change that to all off-site light poles will be removed. And then the second bullet, um, It's talking about in the second sec sentence of Conservation Administrator would like there to be no light spillover in these areas. Talking about the wetlands, moving the two aforementioned light poles onto the site and adding shields and the proposed fixtures could help with this. So I think that can be shortened or um, you know reduce that. We'll add a shield to prevent light spillover into the wetland because uh, the existing ones would be removed. I would suggest uh, that will achieve zero foot candles at the property line. How we do that is we may end up moving a pole, we may end up ending it, adding a shield, we don't know that we're going to add a shield. We will address the, uh, we'll, yeah. we will say that we'll get to zero foot candles at the property line. Yeah. Okay. So these things that they're agreeing to, I'll add to the list of conditions as well, because findings are findings, but conditions are binding. Should we also put in a lights will be off one hour after the close of business? Yeah. In the next section, uh, which is item 11, landscaping, um, there's a comment at the end of it talking about depressing the islands uh, to capture stormwater. The reality is we really can't do that. Uh, the grading, we have to get it to the catch basin, so there's no way to get water in them. And then the soil itself is relatively poorly drained, so we would be concerned about standing water and issues that arise from that. Um, I won't speak for Mike and the plants, but they usually don't like to be sitting in water. Um, so I would, I would, I don't know if that needs to be in there at the end. Nope, it can come out. Um, fencing, uh, I'm proposing to reword that to the wooden guardrail and chain link fencing along the perimeter of the shell site will be entirely removed. 
and then strike at a minimum <coughs> portion blocking the paraquisite entrance will have to be removed. So the proposal is to take out all of that and we're replacing it with landscaping. Wait, so you want me to just change may to will or take out the second part of that sentence as well? Uh, both. Okay. And then page five, just the order conditions. I'm sure that's a standard uh, issues in order conditions on you putting the date. Uh, I don't know what that date's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'll, I'll reword so we don't have to have a date. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Public hearing. Move that the CBDC close the public hearing for the site plan review of Perico Implants North at 95 Walkersburg Drive. All in favor? Any other edits or conditions? So I was going to add John's comments about the signage yep. to the signage condition, um, adding the yield sign and the directional sign, um, just being more specific about that. Mm -hmm. And then um, add some the things we talked about regarding the lighting um, as well. One of the side effects or, or results of the development will be a change in the circulation for the shell station. And we should at least acknowledge that, I think, as part of the uh, process. And I know that, I mean, they, they will obviously be talking to their neighbor. It's I, I guess the, the way that the shell station uses um, their property um, is is ad hoc right now. I mean, it, people do it because they can, um, not because they have the right to do it. So I'm not sure we necessarily want to. I mean, it's it's. I don't know if we memorialize that in any way um, that well, people aren't are you okay. know, the, using their property when they shouldn't be. If when I when I give myself a second thought, um, there's an existing easement that allows the um, I've forgotten the name of the company. The Aristonics. No, the the Aristonics. Aristonics, yeah. That allows the Aristonics people to come in and run left along the fence on the Shell Station property. And that easement probably should be modified in order. Um, There's actually not an easement that goes across to the left. There is. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that, that's an easement. The the piece of it that runs along the back of their property is probably going to go away. Right. So, with well, this an update um, required on the shell station easement, I believe. Okay. Or desirable. Not shown on the points. It was part of the ingress granted when the gate came across the back and prohibited direction back through the other Yeah. And and there would be no need for Marigo to have the easement that came around the drive through if it had the access to come right. to come back. So it just becomes outdated. Um <coughs> okay. It would give them having us not traverse across their property gives them greater flow for their customers too. Well, and in fact, now you're putting up an island that will prohibit right. you, your customers from use exercising that easement unless they, um, you know, <laughs> want to go for a while. For our staff, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, it does. 
but that's not a bad idea to make that as a finding that it's that that easement exists yeah. and it's expected not to be yeah. superseded. Yeah. Utilized. Okay. Yeah, just throw that into the findings. Yep. Anything else? No. Mm -hmm. That was that. Okay. Um, we move that the CPDC approve the site plan review decision for the Perico Implants North project at 95 Walkers Brook Drive as amended. Second. All in favor? I'm going to sleep so good tonight. <laughs> Thank you, folks. I really you appreciate your time. Your time. This you. is incredible. Thank you. We'll be in touch with you tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. All right. Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Um. There's a couple of people here that I think are here for the design guidelines. I don't know if you want to mention. I don't know if we're going to get to it. We have a lot. And I wanted to talk to you guys about the town meeting presentation. Yeah. I didn't think uh, what Julie's mentioning is that it looks like this meeting is going to run late and we were going to push off the 40 yard design guideline discussion. So if you're here for that, you can hang around if you want. <laughs> we're probably not going to get to it. Can I just ask Nick, is it, is it still on for the agenda for the main meeting? Yes. And do you yes. know the time for that, roughly? Um, uh, probably later, I guess. I'll, I'll check it out. It'll be under other topics, and we'll fit it in when we can. Um, but you can always check the agenda like the week before and get more specifics or contact me. Thanks. Okay, so next up is the concept plan review for a two lot subdivision at 40 Grove Street. Good evening. I'm Josh Latham here tonight on behalf of David Orbosch. He has the property of 40 Grove Street here in town. Uh, with me this evening are Mr. Orbosch and Jack Sullivan, his engineer. Uh, we requested this time tonight to speak informally about a concept with regards to subdivision uh, approval. Uh, we've submitted a plan which shows the concept that we can uh, conform with all subdivision regulations for this site to yield a two lot subdivision. Uh, to give you a brief description of the background of the site, uh, it's located in the S15 district. It's also in the Aquifer Protection District, the Overlay District. That's approximately 57,700 square feet of area. On the site is a historical home built circa 1850. That's the earliest that we can source it on a map in town. It is on the historical inventory in town as well. So to summarize, Mr. Orbosch is interested in, in proposing a subdivision for this site to yield two lots. His intent is to maintain the historic structure as part of this process. Uh, the first plan we submitted shows we can meet all subdivision regs. Uh, it would allow for a construction of the full 60-foot uh, right-of-way with a 30-foot paved street with, with sidewalks, etc. I think it raises the question, is this really what would be appropriate for this type of a site? Uh, it's a two-lot subdivision. It's a real low-impact kind of project. The town regulations are really crafted after the more traditional, you know, large-scale subdivisions. And so Reading doesn't have a shared driveway by law doesn't have any other mechanism to do a low impact subdivision. The only avenue with its left is to do this through waivers. The proposal that we have is to do a reduced impact site, and that's the second plan I'm pursuing. That plan is entitled Conceptual Subdivision Plan. And you'll see that that plan shows uh, a reduced 40 foot right of way, much of which is intended to remain as open area, uh, and really proposing a 14 foot traveled way paved driveway. Again, this is much more akin to a proposed shared driveway rather than a true subdivision public way. There's a lot of benefit to this. Again, because it's a small scale um, project, two lots, it's lower impact. I have much less land disturbance required, much less impervious area. Um, maintain the existing home. There's also a 50 inch specimen beech tree. Uh, which is within the area that a 60-foot right of would require that we take down. Uh, this would allow us to preserve that tree. Uh, we did meet with Julie and Ryan to briefly discuss this just as a, as a concept. Um, that led to a DRT where we had some revised plans that we've submitted. I'm sure that you have those notes. Really, everything has been positive feedback that we've received to date. 
So why are we here tonight? Again, just to get your, your informal input before we spend the time, the money, and the effort uh, of going forward with fully engineered definitive subdivision plans requesting a multitude of waivers um, to see how the, the Commission feels about this type of a concept. With that, if I could turn over to Jack Sullivan to describe the concept plan. Uh, for the record, it's Jack Sullivan, Sullivan Engineering Group. I don't have too much to add. I thought Josh did a good job giving you the highlights. But one of the critical things with this design, besides the CPDC, is the fire department. Typically, the reason you have a cul-de-sac is to provide a turnaround for emergency vehicles. So one of the key benefits from the DRT, we had the fire department weigh in on that. Um, we're offering to sprinkler this, the, the single family home in the rear. And the fire department said they need uh, 14 feet of access would be sufficient. When they get back to where the driveway is, where they would set up their rig, we widen out to like a 24 foot wide driveway. They need at least 18 feet in order to put their, their riggers down on the side. Um, so they, they were fine with the reduced pavement width coming in on the driveway to allow to, them to open up and they saw the sprinkler system as a benefit. And I, I want to note like in other towns in North Andover, I've done five or six of these designs for one or two lot subdivisions. The towns, the benefit is um, for, for the, for the um, owner is you don't build the road. For the town is they don't have to maintain the road. Um, they don't have to go in fix curb lines. They don't have to repave it. Um, for trash pickup and everything, the owner of this house would bring, bring it out to the street line. So it truly would look like a driveway. The town has no long-term costs associated with a, another public way and for a single lot it doesn't make sense. So most of these towns, uh, North Andover and Lexington in particular, if you can on a proof plan show you can build a fully uh, no waiver complying subdivision to your rules and regulations and, and there's some sort of benefit to the town. So our benefit to the town in this case is preservation of a historic home and where we're in an aquifer protection district. We're, re we're reducing the amount of impervious surfaces, which is the goal of the aquifer district to put water back in the ground. Also, um, this 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 new right-of-way would exist on paper. It, it exists there. You're basically just waiving the construction requirements of sidewalks, curb lines, street lights, and 30 feet of pavement. Um, the existing home right now is a pre-existing non-conforming home as far as the front setback. It's about 17 feet off of Grove Street. Um, the legal frontage for the, the historic home will now become this right away. So by doing that, we maintain more than 20 feet. So it's compliant on the frontage. Now that 17 foot setback on the porch becomes a side yard setback. The S15 district has a 15 foot side yard setback requirement. So now we're taking a non-conforming, making it conforming. It's a little side benefit. But the main benefit in this case is the historic home will stay, and with the aquifer district, we're really reducing the amount of impervious. But if we, if the CPDC thinks this is a good idea moving forward, I'm going to locate trees on the site. Um, I didn't have time with the snow in March; it screwed me up a little bit. I did this survey in, in February, and then we, th there might be more benefits that some uh, mature trees could be saved, and we could further show that they'd be saved if we had to do a full-scale development as opposed to this development we can do a tree count and show what sort of tree um, inventory will be saved then I'll turn it over to the, the board for any questions they might have this is the uh, the approach first pioneered by one Brad Latham I believe <laughs> and, uh, right? this was that existing house that the grandparent had uh, Oh, oh. grandchildren or to build oh, yeah. their home remember I think it had to go through town meeting we had to change something. Well, so that was the PRD yeah, process. That was a different process. Yeah, but yeah. It was the same idea. Same idea but yeah different. Yeah, different. So that was PRD. Huh? Good chief in town. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there I mean is there any benefit to making the top of the driveway a larger T for the T shape for the truck to be able to do its movements or can the truck the fire truck make its vehicle move. Yeah. Yeah, up the top. Yeah, we could do we could do some type of turnaround like a, I could come up with a T a T shape or something like that just so they don't have to back up. But mm -hmm. at the DRT meeting, like they said, if there's if there's an emergency and where we're putting sprinklers in, if they had to get back there and 
had to come back out onto the street, they do it all over town. I could, though, I could provide like a, a T turnaround or a, a Y or something so they could, they could more easily Mark, turn I just around. See that as being safer than having a backup. I mean, they could yeah. do it, they could obviously make the movement right there at the other driveway. They had to. That's the one thing that jumped out at me is sure they can get back there, but can they turn around and, and, and it may not, you know, if it's a fire truck, they're going down there and you don't care if they ruin the lawn or anything, but there may be some other things. I mean, that's a long driveway. There may be a need for some bigger, some bigger trucks to go down there that aren't, um, that aren't um, fire apparatus yeah. that you don't, that you don't want. It's a fair point. The driveway just, is, it's, it's 300 feet long. Yeah. So it, it is like, and we, we could look into doing some type of turnaround that would meet the fire apparatus turning movements. Any issue with us waiving all of these things? Is there anything that prevents us from waiving all of the waivers that need to be applied to this? Not that I know of, but I don't have like a whole list of waivers because they haven't done like fully engineered design. But, I mean, as we understand, really, as long as it's meeting the public interest and doesn't derogate from the intent of the subdivision control law, providing access to the lots being created, so you have full description. Okay. Comments or questions? <clears throat> well, the plan uh, shows approximately 14 feet uh, curb cut at Grove Street, and that seems a little bit constrained. I mean, it's, it would be. Um, some relief around that or actually good good point I would maybe this section probably this section from Grove Street to where this driveway is I might want to go like 20 to 22 and then narrow down to 14 going the rest of the way okay. just to allow two-way movement in that section so there's no conflict between David here and then the the owner here if someone's pulling in right. someone's coming out I, I should probably widen in that stretch that's a good point point. and then I could narrow up through this section here keep the 14 yep. feet that's a good point okay. is there any way to prohibit or do you expect to allow people to actually park on the sides of the driveway it, it is possible to prohibit it because the intent is to get this as a private way maintained by the homeowners. And so within that, it would be a trust document. And within the trust, we can impose restrictions. And so it can say it can simply be used for, for passage. And all parking has to be outside of the travel way. I'm just thinking you have a party, you have whatever. People are going to be parking on the sides of that, of that driveway. I don't know if you want to make it a little, a little bit bigger. Maybe 16 feet, 18 feet. But I'm also thinking that the front house, for them parking in the back, not knowing where the entrance is, they may even want to park on the side. Where it may be shorter distance to walk to get to, into the house. <clears throat> We've done things where if, if we have a 14 foot paved area, we could have like a two foot gravel shoulder that's compacted into a, so that we still cut down on the pavement. That was something we discussed with the fire department, trying to reduce and still give a shoulder that could support their, their outriggers if needed. Um, but the, then the idea was as long as we had a, a, an area up top, like a pad area that they could set on, it was fine. But we could do that. We, we were trying to keep pavement to a, to a minimum. But I get your point on overflow parking, but that would have to be one heck of a party if they're lining off. <laughs> well, actually, there's not much parking up at the front, so each car is about 20 feet. Ten people would put you at about 200 feet, wouldn't it? <laughs> and you're eliminating a garage on the current existing house. Correct. And in three years, where do you expect them to build the new garage? <laughs> well, they would have to comply. So this would become the, the, the right of way becomes the property line. Mm -hmm. They'd have to be at least 20 feet off because that's, that's the front yard. You can't have a gar garage within your front yard. So it, it, would, it would probably be back in this area. Actually, it would have, wouldn't it have to be behind the house at this point? Mm -hmm. No one. You have to meet the accessory structure. We don't, we don't know what they would do. They might raise a part of that one-story piece. I'm not going to speculate on how they... If it was detached, it has to be 10 feet off the primary structure, 
20 feet off the front setback if it's attached yeah. then it could just be so it would be just it would depend what david wants yeah. to do if he does want to do something we're not showing anything yeah. to be done but in the future if he wanted a garage he could the garage has my lawnmower in it <laughs> I'll take it. The lawn or the garage. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, it's uh, it seems to be a positive all around. Yep. Yeah. They can simply put in the traditional street, <coughs> a couple of houses attached to it. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't object to it. I think that's what I would say. Is, you know from a precedent setting situation because we can show conformity otherwise it doesn't pigeonhole you in the future for having granted one waiver in this case for others in the future uh, again we're proving conformity as part of this process and I think that's what gives the leeway okay. um. well for the board I've got a simple question how far would you allow a driveway would you allow one for a thousand feet we have driveway regulations. You have the right to access your property, don't you? You have the right to access your property, even if it crosses over wetlands. Okay. The engineering division has driveway regulations. There might be something in there, but okay. um, I don't know off the top of my head. We have a limit. They don't have a limit on the length, but they control like the grades of the driveway mm -hmm. widths. Um, there's a whole doc. It's on the engineering website, but there's no maximum length. Okay. I would say you have better ability to save existing specimen type trees with a narrow driveway like that than you do when you have to put a roadway in in a traditional roadway. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's a benefit. And this could be low impact type design too. You wouldn't need curves. You could do swales and stuff on the edges and in fact that's my idea. We, sure. Since we're in the aquifer de district, the, the um the new house would have a dry well, and then we do something with like either a crushed stone shoulder on each on one side, super elevate the road, have a drain over. So it would be a very low impact drainage system. Um, we're not getting into storm scepters or underground infiltration areas. Right. It'd be very, very low impact. And we can work, work with the topography of the site. Oh, nice. All right. Great. Nice. It's not a public hearing. I was going to say, do we take public comments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I'm Virginia Adams from the Historical Commission. And from the Historical Commission's viewpoint, we're very pleased to see the uh, historic property remaining. And it looks like a, a very good, um, intriguing design to make everything work out. So we're very supportive of it. Yeah, yeah it doesn't impose itself on the, uh, on the historic structure. Unless the historic structure stand by itself, which is nice. Great. Great. Thank you for your time. See you again. Uh, next up, major modification to an approved site plan for 306 Main Street. And we did a courtesy notice to abutters for this one, not required. You don't need to read it. Yeah. Let everybody know. All right. In case they wanted to come out. Uh, the members of the board, planning staff, thank you for sticking around late to uh, hear our case. My name is uh, Allison Hammer. I'm a consultant. I represent the uh, owner of the property um, and the business that intends to locate there, uh, Gene Machado from Power Home Loans. Also in attendance, we have a familiar face, Jack Sullivan, um, our uh, civil engineer. We have Bernardo, uh, our architect, and uh, Victor, our general contractor. Uh, some of you might be all too familiar with this project, uh, with the original special permit originating in uh, 2015 for Louisa's Pizza World, and then it was uh, renewed uh, 2017 
And now we're coming uh, in for the amendment uh, as we're looking to primarily uh, change the use from a pizza restaurant to a general office building, uh, specifically for uh, Tower Home Loans, Gene's business. Um, and then there are some attendant changes that came to the structure in order to uh, accommodate that new use, uh, as well as some very uh, minor changes to the site plan. Um, and so, um, if you would you prefer to hear first about the architectural changes or the site changes? Um, Start with the site and then go to the building. Great. So I'll hand over to Jack. Okay. For the record, Jack Sullivan, Sullivan Engineering Group. If we can go to the site plan, I'll go through some of the changes and um, kind of refresh the board on the whole site layout. Um, so when Pizza World came in, the footprint of the building was 40 by 55. That's what was approved. This is the same location, same building footprint, same location. Um, the site circulation is still the same. Um, the number of parking spaces is still the same. I have a typo in my summary table in the upper right hand corner of that site plan. I had noted there were 18 spaces. There's actually a total of 17 spaces, 16 conventional parking spaces and one conventional parking space. Um, but we did not, that, that was a typo from Pizza World as well. So I didn't actually change anything with, with the parking layout, number of parking spaces, the dumpster location is the same. The changes that, that were made is with the Pizza World application, the AC units were right at the rear of the building and there were gonna be two bollards in that location. Bernardo will talk about this, but in his architectural plans, the AC units have now been um, moved to the, the, the roof of the building. He's provided screening and all that, but he can go through that with his architectural design. So that's, that's a change in the positive. They've been taken off the ground and put on top of the building. At the rear of the building, we added a concrete walkway. Um, this was paved before. It, did, it doesn't affect our travel lane. We already, already had 18 feet because, as I stated before, we had AC condenser units here with bollards. There was also a rear door to the Pizza World here with bollards um, that has been removed. That walkway's been added for continuity, but it hasn't affected any, uh, affected any of our travel movements through the site. With the Pizza World, Brandon Simpson had proposed some outdoor seating. There was a fenced area with pad, a patio. That's all been removed this, this is where it's not a restaurant anymore. There's no sense to have outdoor seating. But what we have, we have done, we eliminated the patio and the fencing, but we have um, provided um, pedestrian access through a central walkway so that someone, if they're walking down Main Street, can still access the site. Um, talked about the two bollards being removed from this area. Uh, one change, the only change made on the utility plan is the Pizza World did not have um, a proposed fire suppression system uh, for this site. We're gonna have a dedicated domestic water service line, but there'll also be a fire protection line, either a two inch or a four inch line run to the building. That still needs to be sized by a fire protection engineer, um, but that, that will be added to this building. As far as Mass DOT, we had obtained permits with Pizza World for the, the curb cuts and utility work. Um, we believe those permits just run with the owner, not with the site, and I think they expired anyway, you only have so long to act on them. Uh, so we're gonna be reapplying to Mass DOT for, for both the curb cuts and the utilities. I don't see that being a problem. They had already issued them. Um, and a lot of the, the notes, uh, all the signage um, for stop signs and turn movements, those had been all uh, approved by Mass DOT before, so they should be the same. We will be going in front of the Conservation Commission Wednesday night, um, bringing up these minor changes, but I just wanted to make this point aware that we'll be in front of them Wednesday. And I'll turn it over to Bernardo for the architectural plan so he can go over the changes on the architecture. Okay. Good evening. Bernardo Jose. Yeah, the first proposal for the building was, was the, the pizzeria, so when we took over, we decided to, to, in order to speed up the process, we decided to keep the same footprint, use the same foundation, the same volume, and the only thing that 
change the in the, the layout. So and what the proposed in this proposal, the impact on the site is going to be less than if it was going to be a pizzeria. So it's going to be less traffic. The, they have uh, now they have only 12 employees, so is the, the parking space is going to be about the same. And what we did, like Jack mentioned, the, the mechanic is going to be on the on the ceiling of the building. And a couple of topics that come up in that uh, the first review, I think was a bar label on the first floor, so that is. It's kind of misleading because it's not going to be a bar per se. It's going to be a place where they can have refreshments, a coffee machine, and water for clients and employees. If you look at the first floor, they show a bar in that corner there. The other issue that came up with uh, was the, the sign because we we are going to apply for a wall sign and a stand. Uh, freestanding sign, and just because the, the, the wall sign is going to be for the, the main building, for the main use of the building, but uh, as, as today they have only 12 employees, so he wants to keep the option to lease the second floor. That's going to be, maybe they are going to have another, another tenant, so that's why <coughs> we are going to apply for various for no, maybe. Either it is a multi-tenant building or it isn't. Well, and if no, it is... No, because the building is oversized for, for the, the, it's either, for the company it's now. Either if it's either applying like a multi-tenant building. In which case they don't need a variance. Right. Or it is not a multi-tenant building and they would need a variance for a wall sign and freestanding sign. So it is, it is something that can be done later because right now there is going to be one... It's going to be just one company for the building, but they want to keep that option. If they lease the second floor, they want to have a free standing side. Yeah, I mean, so that, that can be worked out later. Well, how does that work? If, they, if this building gets constructed... Right. If they need a variance, it's from the Zoning Board of Appeals. But right now, if it gets constructed as a single-tenant building... Then they can they get one... They, they can get one or the other of the signs, or they can apply to the zoning board for a variance to have both. Right. Right. I don't know that they understand that. Yes. I think they can just decide later that it's a multi-tenant building. Well, we can proposal. put a condition to try to make it more clear. Yeah, he just wants to have the option if he needs to, to lease the building because it is not going to occupy the whole building for now. But if he leases the building, doesn't he need a separate entrance? No, it, it closed yeah, so we, we already have that. Uh, when we approached the uh, design of the building, we s understood that that was a possible eventuality uh, if uh, Gene's business, you know, grows or contracts over time as, uh, you know, being the mortgage market. So, as you can see, we have entrances at either end of the building. Yes, um, I, I can show you. It's good. Yes, yeah, we have this one. It's going to be the zip the main for the first floor and we have this option because this is going to be built so you have the option to close this wall and then have the access to the second floor for this. but as of today they're not closed no so it's as of today it's going to be okay. one company two floors i would not grant you a variance for a sign for a building you created yep a single tenant Okay. If you've imposed the condition on yourself, I don't see how you could meet the criteria for a variance for the sign. I think you're better off saying that it is a multi-tenant building now. Yeah. Okay, now is... Does it change anything? Does it change parking? Does it change... It probably changes some building code requirements. Um, but that I don't know. They'd have to talk to Glenn. Yeah. All right. Yeah. As of today, it's going to be a single... Okay. Single well, one. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess and it depends on what your anticipated tenants are. Like, if you're anticipating office tenants, then this review with you guys will change. But if if something different comes in that has different parking requirements, different, you know, then you have to go okay. back. I think what we're, we're recommending is that you design it from the get-go as a multi-tenant building. Yeah. Yeah, this is going to be a single-tenant building. Dual-tenant building. Um, because if, 
if you if one company occupies both spaces, that's fine. But if later you want us to split it with two companies, then it should be a, a multi-tenant building from the from the beginning. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what the change would be. You're going to sprinkle the building. Yeah. Uh, do you have to fire rate the floor, the floor ceiling, for multi-tenant yeah. building? Fire rate. So you're going to build it that way? Yeah. All right. So you're going to build it like a multi-tenant building. <laughs> Just put the door in over there and leave it open. Right. Uh, because I'll show up at that zoning meeting and, and voice my opinion against the variance for the sign. Okay, so that's right. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I understand that. It's just because he wants to keep, he, he wants to keep open though. But his options Option. are open. It makes it easier for you down the road. Okay. So, so uh, let me just uh, first thank you very much. I'm not sure if I should be talking as yeah. well, <laughs> anything, but just interject. So the whole idea when we start this conversation was uh, we just don't know how the mortgage uh, market will continue to uh, go. Uh, if it continues strong the way it is, we'll use the whole building for years to come. But we just don't know. If in, in case we need to downsize, of course we want to have the option to lease part of the building. That's the only thing that we discussed. And yeah. I appreciate Bernard bringing this before you guys because now it makes more sense what you just recommended. Right. That we start in the whole thing with these applications as a multi-tenant and we occupy both spaces. So that's how we're going to do it. And then all you have to do is apply for the sign. That's it. Right. And it's But he'd apply for the sign when he leases out the second space. When it's leased out, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's one yeah. sign now. Yeah. But clear. you don't have to deal with the variance process later. Whatever, whatever you have to add to it now to make it a multi-tenant building, I think is probably less tedious than that process. I think it's already yeah, it's just a door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just there's no, there's no guarantees you would get the variance. Right. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. I would argue that you built the building, you created <laughs> the condition. Another topic that we want to address is about the loading dock. Because it's an office building, so we don't need a loading dock. It's loading just space. a. Loading space, yeah. Loading space. I believe that was waived in the prior application for it Pizza was. World. They could park around back and probably make a small box truck or something. It's probably just office supplies and small stuff. And for the site lighting, we uh, we still work with that, but it's going to the proposal is to have LED is 12 feet high old, so it's going to be is a nine to five building, so it's not going to be. Light all nights uh, at seven o'clock they are going to close, so it's going to be only safe lights and for the site. So it's not going to be any light on the site for the at night. How does the uh, how does this building height compare to the Pizza World building height? It's the same. Same height, again? the same. Yeah. Even to the top of the roof. Yes. Okay. Can you? Yeah, we kept the we kept all the original volume, yeah. the one that we. Already for I don't recall them having this dormer though. No, no, no. I don't like no, this dormer. No, not dormer. No, the dormer was added. Yeah. I mean, the window's not even centered, and I, I think it's <laughs> just in the wrong spot because. No, the the, the the volume is the same, but not the dormers. And the back of the building now we have the mechanical. So if you look at the elevation. Yeah, the back elevation. So it's going to be next to Yeah, the back elevation I don't care about, but I don't like that dormer on the front. I just think it's, first of all, again, graphically, the center window is offset by accident, I think. Oh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, it just, it's not doing anything. You know, it's just kind of sitting there. If you don't need it. The reason for the dormer is um, to be able to utilize the area uh, under the roof peak for uh, office storage. Their office creates a lot of uh, paperwork uh, they, and that they need to keep, uh, you know, on site. Uh, the PDG storage, so they wanted to um, make that attic space. It's uh, not habitable space. It's just going to be kind of uh, deep storage. So that was really just to be able to increase uh, the utility of that area. You have a sink and a kitchenette up there. So it's not really a kitchenette. It's more of a utility sink. It's like yeah. a sink, a counter, a coffee maker, refrigerator. Yeah, usually, stay, yeah, the idea, is, the idea when we start discussing that place is this, uh, we need to keep some of the paperwork we produce for five years. So we're gonna put all the uh, hard cabinets there, and because 
employees normally to pay. That's how we do. We eat on top of our computers. We say, okay, if if possible, if they can have a place that they can go up, up there to eat and go back. So that was the idea when we started talking about this. Okay, but um, a couple things. Aren't you required by your insurance to keep the paperwork off site? No. Really? So if it all goes up in flames, you have no backup anywhere. <laughs> I know we, we have are. everything scanned. But it's sprinklered and fire yeah. separated. So. Yeah, such so as this slurry of paper. Um, <laughs> it sounds to me like they're using that space, not like storage space. Is that included in the calculation for the parking? No. Yes. No. When, when you tell me, uh, Bernard, in regards to space, if it's less than 1,500, how Yeah, it's 300 square feet for you. For each of the three hundred square feet, we have one parking space. We have a plane of uh, six. Yeah, so it is included uh, for the two for the two floors. We have if you required it, it, fifteen spaces for the yeah. first floor and the second floor. Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, the third floor will add more than what we have. No, because it's going to be two stories. How much floor area is the attic? Oh, it's, it's close to less than 300. How can it be less than 300 when it's 34 by 10, just the one piece of the attic? So that's each floor is the main floors are 2200. Another so visually, that looks like a little, a little bit a little bit less, a little bit less than half. So we could call maybe a thousand square feet, 900 square feet, something like that. I don't know. Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's close the dorm, to six or yes. seven hundred square yeah. feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, not including the not counting counting the dorm. Yeah. And can you technically call a space that people eat in like a not a habitable space? It doesn't, seem, <coughs> it doesn't seem right. Not habitable? Because didn't you say it's like not habitable space? Yeah, we're gonna, we're but then there's like a kitchenette in there. So yeah, we're the, yeah. We're the, the intention was to you know, keep the ceiling height under seven feet, um, so that's not technically. Uh, According to the building code, habitable space, uh, so that include the three storage area is the uh, intention. The plans show it at seven feet. Yeah, you can have eight feet and it's two feet storage. <laughs> right. yeah. To be out of space needs to be at least seven. But you can have a, a storage space that's a stand or eleven or twelve, doesn't matter. Storage space, but you're showing tables up there. Office supplies. File cabinets, you know. You're showing it like it's a workable space. And let me ask you this question Do you need a third means of egress from the third floor? I know second story under 3,000 or whatever, probably okay, but. Yeah, and the, the building's gonna be sprinkled, so we don't need that. I don't know that the sprinklers change how many egress you need from. I change because of the, the path of egress, so what is required? System, so it no single single space with a single means of egress is typically calculated by the number of people and the egress distance. Yes, yeah, but it's storage space. I mean, for the storage space, we don't need that. Okay, I think what we'll, we'll probably um, maybe we'll have to discuss this with the building department. But our, our understanding is that keep that non-habitable space. Um, that we can maintain the building code exemption that allows the single left the single means of egress in the business use two stories one means of egress um, single staircase and only non habitable space for storage in the attic. But shouldn't that storage be dead storage, not filing cabinets so much? Is more like boxes where you really can't get to it. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be fireproof, I think. I mean, it's gotta be protected. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if there's any I don't know if any requirements like that. I think you know this the, these uh, documents need uh, not daily access, so, you know like Gina was saying they need to keep five years of backlog. So they just need to sit somewhere safe. Um, but you know I don't think uh, boxes versus uh, you know a, a fire safe uh, cabinet it's a Um, all right, so you gotta you gotta figure out what the code issues are on that and whether that impacts parking. The floor area should be noted on the total building area, regardless. I think, um, and that dormer has to be reworked. It's just it's too prominent a site, you know. Um, 
We have way too many ugly buildings on South Main Street. <laughs> Doing pretty good for two stories, and then you got this shed dorm that just kind of does nothing. So is it the shed aspect of the dorm that you don't like, or is it just um, something about the proportions that doesn't appeal to you? Uh, it's the shed aspect mostly. It's probably about the right width once you center that secret window in the middle. <laughs> But I think it's the, what the roof is doing. I, I don't know what the resolution is, and I'm not going to figure it out right now. But probably, probably not. The umbrella light or something. It just, I don't think it should be a shed dormer. Okay, we can play around with the, uh, with the shape of that dormer a little bit and see if we can come up with something that's uh, a little bit more contextual with the architectural style. Yeah, just something that doesn't look like the back of a bad house. Okay. You know? <laughs> And then your sign, see if you can figure out how to integrate that sign better. I think Pizza World had a wider band and all their signage was going to be in that band. This just looks like someone took a sign and stuck it on there. Like you have, you're designing your building, so make it, make it something, make it, make it an event. Yeah. Can I add one comment too about the whole lighting? I've, it seems to me that this is an awful lot of lighting for a site. It's an awful I think that's just a. Is that even shown on the site plan? I don't have it shown on my site. I think it's just a rendering thing. So just on, yeah, just a yeah. rendering. Yeah. Okay. How many have you gotten to that yet? How many pole lights are you going to have? Uh, I think it's going to be 12. How many? 12. 12? Well, that's a lot. That's, <laughs> that's, that's maybe that's the point. That's a lot of pole lights. And you're saying they're how tall? How tall are the lights? 12. 12 feet. 12. Mm -hmm. Quantity 12 feet tall. The LED source here. We try to keep some just shield in front of it. On your way out, go past the library. <laughs> All of these lights that you're showing us would have unshielded, so you're definitely spilling, not only are you spilling beyond the property line, but you're going to create this big glare. We don't usually like. So figure out what type of light fixture you're going to use, what it looks like. You know, I just don't want to stare at a bulb. I forgot what the Pizza World. I don't know. I think they had goosenecks. They had a couple of goosenecks on the floor. We had goosenecks. Pizza World. Yep. Yep. That's what we used to see. Well, we'll look at the lighting. I know it's a sensitive yeah. issue. Well, you're, you've got residential right behind you, so. Yep. We'll try to reduce the number if we can do something. For me, the issue, I, it's just um, it's like this big, flat facade. But, um, you know, certainly probably changing the, the dormer would do something to break it up. But, you know, awnings or something, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's absolutely no architectural detail at all. Um, and that's a big, um, it's a big wall to just be flat so something there I think yeah. set up yeah even if you put some vertical trim and divide it up into a two three two break that thing up and then that'll give you the lines to use for the dormer right. you figure it out awnings are nice we like awnings. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, the, the doors get mixed. So the, um, the doors uh, just fade into the front of the building. So something to indicate that there's, it up a that bit. it's the oh, yeah. right. The problem, our problem yeah. on um, on South Main Street is really you access all the buildings from the back. Um, and we don't want the back, the front of the building on the street to look like the back of the building, even though maybe functionally it is. So something oh, yeah, to make no, it and look and more like that. We need like to, to work on some more details, some yeah. architecture details yeah. for the entrance to just to put more in, in evidence the entrance, the main entrance, you can know, send it. Okay. Are the awnings exempt from the front setback or awnings? We're, we're almost on I the front so. setback line. I think they yeah, are. Yeah, but they I never checked the zone. Yeah, yeah. 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 they are. Yeah, they overhang sidewalks. They overhang sidewalks as long as they're eight feet high, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the 
only other thing I noticed is we've got uh, tandem parking in the back. No. It's because that of the conservation there. land. That's okay. Right. And that's the same as we had for Pizza World. Those are going to be employee spaces, and that's how they could manage the, manage the tandem yeah. parking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that that's where you'll put all your employees in those employee spaces. So those won't be open to the public, and they'll be they'll be labeled for employees. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly that's intensive. Then the restaurant had the delivery people plus the you right. know, people right. coming in, so it should be a much much calmer site. I appreciate that you're, you want to use it. We've been hoping some of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's going to be yeah. my comment. <laughs> so we'll help you get through it. Yeah. yeah. It's been sitting vacant for quite a while. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Can I ask a question? So is it possible that uh, the board can make the recommendations of everything that you suggest we do with the site? And we incorporate that in our plans, and we can move on from that point on, following the recommendations, just uh, and finish it administratively. So, uh, Julie, we can get all the recommendations that you propose into the plan and incorporate that. So we don't need to schedule another year. Uh, I mean, there's an issue about what that third floor becomes, what that is. Mm -hmm. How that's classified, what the building looks like. Um, you know, you might come back and not be able to do certain things or something. If that's the case, we would have to come back anyways. And I can I add one thing. Just, just we have to go to the conservation meeting on Wednesday. If they want any changes and we close anything with them, we'd have to reopen. It doesn't hurt us to continue this. Go to conservation, then come back to them with the changes. What's your schedule with DOT? Do you know? I don't know. I I haven't submitted any materials yet. No. I have them all set to go. I can put them in. I don't expect that they would reject it at this point, do we? No. Hasn't been a change in staff. The utilities is that it. The utilities get submitted. The town's the actual applicant because they own the utilities. Yeah. That they'll sign off right away because they sign off on the town applications quick. And they had already approved the entrance yeah. and, the, and the signage and the radius. Everything had been approved. So it's just a matter of getting it through the process at this point, not. So I'm trying to do a cover letter saying they approved it under, a, submit the old one, say, new owner coming in, we just want to, same plan, give them the plan. Okay. With a new fee, they want their money. The concern from our end is just that, um, as you may be aware, the special permit expires in May. Um, that we're asked for modification under. So we're just anxious to, uh, you know, get our conditions and um, execute them and uh, get started. Well, we can grant the next action, can we? You already did. And the um, site plan bylaw doesn't really have a provision for another extension. Um, but like I said, typically, like doing some site work is enough to consider that the permit's been being exercised. Um, I just I don't know how it will go with conservation and whether you'll be able to start site work, um, but that's not our problem. Well, but you, so all you're really coming back for is the building look, the aesthetic, because the, um, the decision on what that third floor is in life, right? Yeah. And just so the board knows, we have an active order of conditions. So they could go in and put up a DEP sign, put in some hay bales, no matter what conservation says Wednesday night, even if they want site changes. So we can get moving with some of the site work. Right. We just want to make sure, as Allison stated, we, we don't want to all of a sudden find that we lapse for some reason. So we want, to, we want to just keep our permit active however we do that. Well, I think what you're hearing from this board is that for, you know, the footprint, right, which is what matters in that context, I didn't hear anything from us about the, the footprint and that really sort of the site layout. The so, general site looks yeah, okay. Right. Um, so, um, so you can take, I guess you can, <laughs> you, I think that, that helps you sort of minimize your risk um, in terms of moving things along without this final approval. I think the best we can do. <laughs> Okay. We want it. 
When's the next meeting? May 7th. May 7th? When's the next May 18th, I believe. But I mean, I, th I think they will be able to do some site work and that we're not. Mm, okay. Yeah. I mean, we're not interested in stopping activity on a permitted site. So, um, I'm, I'm not remembering the agenda for May 7th. I forgot to print it, but I think it could either be 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Um, which I'll let you know the time. Okay. That's the best we can do. Thank you. Thank you. There are, by the way, a lot of happy people that there's not another pizza place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need a good we can touch with you guys tomorrow. Oh, oh if you want to, so you know, shell out a lot of money, you can go to Anthony's. Okay, so did you guys want to make a motion to continue it to May 7th? Yes. Can I get a motion to continue this to May 7th at 8.30? Date. Time to be determined. Time to be determined. Yeah. So moved. All in favor? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so planning updates. Anything happening with the pizza roll site? <laughs> um, we should. Oh, actually, um, I want to get your quick input on the Charles Street pump station design from engineering. Hold it up, Andrew. I'm gonna abstain from that since I did some. Yeah. For that um, it's not. You don't have to abstain. It's just. It doesn't trigger anything. I looked at the amount of pavement. Um, the, it's an un, it's an in, unenclosed structure. Yeah, it's a um, generator, right? The pump. Yeah, it doesn't really trigger a view, but I figured I'd let you guys take a look at it and see what you think. And if you had any comments or concerns, I would let Ryan know. Uh, yeah, it's taking out trees, right? Maybe we might need to zoom in on it a little bit. What and is then, this? So that so it's. Um, is it the Killam School? Right there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. like, you know, when you go down Charles Street and it kind of comes into a Charles triangle. And Charles and Haverhill. Yeah, there's like yeah. a little area that's town owned that's past the school. Yeah. And there's a pump station proposed there. Um, the engineering division has been working on a design for it um, with CDM Smith. And Ryan brought it to my attention and I just said I would run it by you guys. So, what do you think? Yeah, so if I remember correctly, it's like one of the critical pump stations in town. And so this is, I think, proposing new pumps and probably backup generators. Um, we did do, back then, I did do some new designs for buildings and stuff in this area, including this, this open the architect wants so just enclosure sure around it. Sure. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so it's, not good. it's probably a lot more expensive. Yeah, I do remember a discussion uh, on it being a building. So, yeah, it was substantial. Small, with this, yeah, so yeah. Kind of shit yeah. Thing. And then the idea with the, I think the town, I think what Ryan said was that the town said, no, we don't want that, and that would have triggered a more comprehensive review. And so then this was yeah. what was decided. And maintaining a building and all of that to go. Right. With it. Yeah. Right. It's a little more work. Um, so if I remember correctly, when we were, when I originally did some renderings for this thing, there were trees that weren't showing up in like some of the Google images and some of the site plans that have been recently planted. So hopefully somebody's surveyed it at this point to figure out where they really are. Um, trees that would be impacted by this that were recently planted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that's what I recall from maybe a year ago. Where is this? So corner of Charles, and Gabriel, and then there's another couple of cut throughs, and I don't know what they're called. You can see that one up there. So that this that way Two leads to yeah. Killam, and that way leads to Burbank. Okay. I did notice that the fence kind of matches the fence on the property um, in the back at the yellow house. I didn't know if that was by design. Getting some context from the neighborhood. <laughs> I didn't do this one. This is not mine. Okay. So, some, um, it's like somebody cleaned it up. Is that a six foot fence or taller? Because you've got a little door in there. I think it's a small door. Um, is it labeled on the plan? I have a door. 
Yeah, I guess if they had to pull the Jenny out, they'd just uh, rip out those plants in the front and open the front of it. Four foot single leaf pedestrian gate. A seven foot high wooden stockade fence. So they'll need a building permit. Seven feet triggers a building permit for a fence, right? Yeah. Isn't it for the town? We don't exempt ourselves from permits. Oh, for that. Depends. Generally speaking. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember. Is it a diesel generator? Is it going to have gas going to it? Is there a let's utility? This is it's probably going to be six feet tall. It's just got seventeen. Yeah, we can build a utility. And then the stack's yeah. going to come up and probably go horizontal. But it, like I said, so the, the thing that's existing is the big circle, the big well, the, the pump right. station itself. Yeah, this thing. That thing is still there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So there, you can see the two young, there's a young tree right behind it. Oh, yeah. Is there right behind it? Yeah. And I think there's another one to the right. There were a few that were planted in that area fairly recently. Yeah. That's all I have to say about <coughs> that. No major concerns with it? No. Mm -hmm. You can put a new no. road in. That's a new road in there, right? No. There's, it's a little bit of pavement. I think it's about 200 feet of pavement. I mean, honestly, I don't it's know if the Google okay. site is any better, but the, the triangle itself could use some TLC. So. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they're proposing to repave and uh, some curbs. Yeah. I think yeah. that the, that second cut through is odd, right? There's two cut throughs yep. through that. Yeah. And the second one, I don't. It, it's probably there because of that. Because I don't think people, I don't think you one right here, typically right? use that unless you miss the first one. Yeah. If you miss that one, you can just take the turn. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Mm, seems like a tiny, unneeded, <laughs> unneeded pavement, but. Uh, Okay, so where are we at? I don't have any concerns. Okay. So you're mostly good with it. I'll ask about the trees. I'll mention the TLC. Sure. I, mean, I, would, I would really ask whether there needs to be a road through there. Does that, do you, who, Can you go to has anyone ever asked why is that second cut through? This there? one right, this, this one right here? Yeah, yeah that, that one. one. That yeah. could just be a drive on one side. Yeah. Is it there now? Yeah. 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 But I'm not sure. I mean, sure. I'm the opposite. I don't think I ever knew about the other one. I'm not sure. Like, I, I know the one. little one. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, there only needs to be one. Like Nick said, if you miss the turn, you just turn. Right. You can uh, just, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. I will pass I, this I, feedback I, along. It's a good question. I mean, if there's a reason for it. Fine. Unless there's a place to park the trucks. That's the only thing I can think of that aren't in the way. Yeah, but they could just have it open from Charles Street and close yeah. it off on Haverhill. Right. Or do like every other park um, on the street. person with a truck does is just park wherever they want. Right? You just pull up on the lawn and park. Already, you can put grass there and it'll just get all messed up again. Right? Yeah. They'll be parking on it. It'll get all gross yeah. and... Gravel down, I guess. Yeah. You should have some place for a truck to park that isn't grass. Yeah, especially I guess if they're going to pay to repave and edge all of that. Yeah. We should think about why we're doing that. Right. There's two sets of minutes, and then we have some. Um, I haven't put together the presentation for town meeting yet, but Tony did put together a um, translation guide kind of between what is in the current bylaw and what's proposed to change. Um, and he had some questions about some things. I thought we would just review those real quick since this is your last meeting before town meeting. Sure. Um, and then Tony and I will work on a presentation, and we can share that with you guys for feedback like via email. Um, 
It's the and then zoning's on the 26th. It's still that way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's Thursday night. The first Thursday night is zoning. So what would, do you want to do first? Town meeting stuff or minutes? Town meeting stuff. Okay. Do you want to walk us through what's going Basically, on? Basically, what I did was I took every single uh, section, put it on the left as proposed, and put the current on the right. Uh, I bolded and italicized any differences so you can just scroll through. If you want to start scrolling down, there's no changes, no changes, no changes. And then we've got the first change where the frontage is moved over to the table. Mm -hmm. Same with the uh, 6231. Change. More move to the table. Fixed 84 to make it 80 4. Now. I scrolled through it and it read, it read fine. I yeah. didn't check the information to make sure that it was correct. Yeah. Uh, the highlighted yellow or anything I had questions about where it says based on shadow studies sub submitted by the applicant. If the applicant studies are incorrect, what happens? The applicant comes in and says my studies show that it doesn't put a shadow on a building. And then it does. Is there, a, is there an issue there? Is there a way of correcting it? What do you mean after the fact? After the fact. Uh, mirrors? Not, probably not without a lawsuit. Yeah. Well, what happens if somebody does something, somebody puts a building and doesn't comply with code? <laughs> Gets torn down. The foundation goes in the wrong spot or something. <laughs> that would never happen. That, that never happens. Never happens. <laughs> um. Um, I mean, the studies shouldn't be wrong unless they calculate them wrong. Usually if you throw and put a piece of software and it's doing the calculations, you're telling it where you are and what days you are and the software knows all of that. You'd have to fake it. You'd have to intentionally tell it something different. Yeah. So I guess if we ask for the studies, we should make sure we look at them uh, in detail to make sure that they're correct. Right. And the studies are part of the site plan review discussion. Um, and usually they're prepared by architects. Architects are lying, cheating. <laughs> But they're putting their their word on it. They are. If we ask them to seal it, then we know it's real. Yeah, we could yeah. do that. We could say okay. se se um, stamped and sealed. And then it'll be right. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. The next one has a change for 75 feet down to 50 and 50 feet down to 20. Uh, hotel or motel, their setbacks. Section C, 25 acres deleted. Keep going, there's no changes so far. All right, another yellow. Uh, buildings per lot. I misread this the first time through, but that's okay because there's still a reference in the PUDI to uh, section 6.2.8, I think, or 6.8. <coughs> so that we may need to make a change there. I think 
think that was part of the email I sent you. Yeah, yeah. but that's a di different section. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not in the four corners of what we're dealing with. So any of those cleanup things that you mentioned in your email, we won't be able to do at this town meeting. Okay. But we'll keep in the back of our minds for the future. Yeah. yeah. Um, more principal builders permitted. So uh, go back up to the top one. Top. 6.2.6.2 and 6.2.7.2 is just a, a significant change, though I haven't highlighted it because it's, there's so much to highlight. Uh, the old said they had to be 50 feet apart, and the new one has a bunch of minimum distances and total distance between the total proposed buildings and so forth. Right. Sorry, what is it we're looking at right now? Uh, six, the two or more principal buildings are permitted on the same lot. The original rule <coughs> was basically they had to be at least 50 feet apart, and that was it. Yeah, and that's not, not, not the case. And, that's not, and the proposal has oh, I see. several different adjustments. I, I see, okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Did you have a question about that? No. It's not yellow, no question. Okay, just I said maybe yeah. your prior email, one of your prior emails. Um, no. Okay. All right, so okay, zoning districts, same, all the same. This is a little harder to keep track of. I had to break, it, break the table down in halves to fit them across. So the, the major changes here are the 20 feet, six and eight. So I think we need to highlight these cells and have changes in them because... Yeah, I wasn't certain how to do that in black and white. People who are... Uh, and, um, do it in the PDF. Put a box Shoot. over it and make it transparent. Make it. Well, and I wonder... You want, to, you want it to white on a gray background? You want it with a gray background? Um, all I'm saying is that, first of all, it's very small and at a distance. Yeah. People who are colorblind won't see the red, first of all. Well, I'm thinking... Well, two things. First of all, is this overcomplicating the table, and would it be better if we just provided, like, the table with the bold and cross-out version of the table yeah. in the format that it's in already, that's in the warrant? And then secondly, um, I was envisioning this as more of a handout than, like, I, I mean, I wasn't really envisioning I was going to make my town meeting presentation with this stuff in it. I think this is way overcomplicating what should be uh, in PowerPoint. Okay, that's fine, but we're going to get this... But this, I would, Members. yeah, like... At the meeting or before? Part of the articles? Part of the um, warrant? Sorry. The warrant's already warrant published. Um, this so would this be a would handout. Be you could put it on the uh, website, but more than likely it would be picked up the night. Most of the town meeting members aren't going to see anything or review anything until that night anyhow. I know, but the ones that do review it get a little pissy when you don't get it <laughs> ahead of time. Rightfully so. Well... Make it known but even if they do, they still wait till town meeting to. Well, couldn't we ask the town clerk to email it or email it to the town meeting members? Probably she is everybody's yeah. email. And then put it on the back. Yeah, yeah, and they and it's possible they could get it the first night of town meeting, and zoning's not until the second night, right? You could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. So yeah. But this is what I used to do for every single change. I would go through, take the two, and just run them through, so I could find out exactly what changed. Well, this is very, very clear, Matt, I think. This is given how much we've changed that kind of went from different spots. Mm -hmm. I right. think this is helpful. Julie, your concern is just the table section. I think the table's yeah. a little yeah. crazy. That's fine, yeah. So but pull the yeah. table and do right. you know, yeah. table one, current, table two, proposed. I just have the table as a separate sheet. Right. Yeah. 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 And bold and cross up. Yeah, and we already that have that version. Yeah. yeah. I think that's. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually pretty clear. That work. Yeah. Um, okay. But this, these textual changes. The text is excellent. Yeah. 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 This is great. And I think. Sorry. Just. I think on the PowerPoint. Before you do this, and maybe as a top for this, if it's getting handed out. You know, identify that the three major changes are one, we've added more detail to the setbacks. Two, we've moved a good amount of detail to footnotes of the table. And then three is some of the landscaping, right? Is that right? Or the. It didn't really change the landscape. Mm -hmm. That's it? 
we did kind of change parameters. There was a change in the uh, transition areas. Transition, right. that's what I meant. I meant. Yeah, right. Where we deleted the 150 feet in an industrial and said it had to be adjoining versus uh, across the street or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just to orient, you know, mm -hmm. this is the three major things that are going on here. Right. Okay. And this is actually a Word document that Julie has, so she can do whatever she wants to it. <laughs> Hopefully not mess it up <laughs> and then <laughs> click it. Oh, you got to be careful with those tables because they get insane. Oh, they are. Yeah. <laughs> no, I hope there's no mistakes this year. They'll find it if there is. They will. <laughs> <laughs> But we won't. It'll take us a while to <laughs> figure out what they're trying to tell us. Um, okay. That's good. Let's go past these two. Yeah. Um, you could also go, oh, no, you can't. Because you're in the PDF version. Yep. In the Word version, you can go and just turn off the, um, the track changes, and then you've got your final and your original, and you, easier to compare. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking the point, though, is to give them the, the track changes, which makes it really clear. Yes. Well, I, what I, I always committed was two versions. The track changes version, which says, okay, these are the actual changes that were made. And then I would do the comparison version as final versus original. Right. So you can just do eyeball it versus having to go through. Like, these, even though there are no changes in 6.24 and 2, it's hard to compare because you've got cross outs and bowls and so forth. I don't think I agree with that. But I'll think about it. As I said, you can do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think those are basically your major changes is the uh, multiple lot, multiple buildings on a lot, uh, the transition areas, and you move the um, all of the special cases into the table as opposed to having them up in the top. Well, and the adjacencies, like the district adjacencies, we dealt with Right, that. the transitional areas. You're, that's what you're referring to as yeah. transitional areas. Okay. And I think we said in the warrant that there was going to be more detail on the changes. We gave on the background, we said some something generic like that. So we just right. gave kind of a basic background of what, you know, the why, why are we doing this. And then the presentation itself, I think the last two, well, at least the last one, we followed a pretty good... Um, approach that I think made sense mm. as long as there weren't any <laughs> any any um, typos or anything that got caught up but where where we um, you know sort of discussed what the overall approach was what the benefits of each change was and sort of kept that at the high level yeah um, and then and then this would be you know great, great. to get into that Right, if anyone wants are. to really get into yeah. it. Um. Which probably would, you know, when they're trying to say, I don't like that word or this is the wrong, having this that everyone can then look at is better than mm -hmm. trying to fumble through. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Do I think that should make it clean mm -hmm. if we do? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for doing this. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a lot yeah. of work. Thank okay. you. Not that much. You have to have a really big screen. Oh. <laughs> and apparently he does it for all zoning all the time, and he's only now recently on the CPD system. <laughs> he was going to do it anyway. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so minutes. Uh, 226. And then I... I gave you copies of the 312 minutes tonight, which you haven't seen. So.
saw part of it on TV. We had this uh, packet last week, right? Um, yeah, the 226 minutes you had, the 312 minutes you did not. There's a lot of words here. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's why these take so long lately. <clears throat> Somebody takes very good notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kim writes super detailed minutes. I like it. People opine. <laughs> Is that, yeah, I use the same like words a lot. <laughs> but try to mix it up next time. them both sets online and found nothing to uh, comment on. on 226. Edits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's different than what? It's the same or different than the prior conversations we've been having? It's the same. It is. Mm -hmm. Think of it as that name, but okay. We're calling it subdistrict, which I took out because since we're not yeah. doing that, it's that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought I would is accurate terminology. <laughs> mm -hmm. No? No comments on Move that the CPDC approve the minutes for the meeting of February 26, 2018. Okay. All in favor?
use a pick them all the time. I love it. <laughs> It, um, it's, it's like one of the governor's housing initiatives. Um, basically, if you can prove that you've created a certain amount of units um, via building permit, that's the proof. Um, in the last five years, you can unlock, you, you unlock grant funding, you make the town a priority for grant funding, mass works grants, complete streets grants, capital grants. Um, and so that's an easy, thing for us to prove. Good. Yeah. It's going to be submitted tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Anything else, guys? Like you, Eden, is continued to uh, May 2nd? That's correct. And it will be at the library. The library. Yep. Yep. Okay. May 2nd, okay. At the library? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. I'm going to have to make a big comment. Is that me there? There it is. Okay. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 